Good evening and welcome. I am Deborah Mecki, Executive Director and CEO of the Greenwich Historical Society. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening, celebrating the debut of John Henry Twachlin Catalogue Resonne. The Catalogue Resonne is the definitive catalog of the work of Twachlin, an important figure in late 19th century American art, often considered the most original among the American Impressionists. It is a project decades in the making under the authorship of tonight's speaker, Dr. Lisa N. Peters, and begun under the auspices of the Spannerman Gallery. Now, after a five-year development process, it has debuted as a free digital resource in a collaboration with the Greenwich Historical Society. Its development and public debut has been generously supported by a gift from the Mr. and Mrs. Raymond J. Horowitz Foundation for the Arts, as well as support from the Cross Family Charitable Fund and the Lunder Foundation. Our partnership with Dr. Peters to bring this project to life was perhaps meant to be. While living in Greenwich, Connecticut from 1890 to 1899, Twachlin created many of his finest paintings and taught art classes in Cos Cobb at the Holly House, where he and several fellow American Impressionist painters boarded. <clears throat> Since 1957, the Greenwich Historical Society has been the steward of the Holly House, now known as the Bush Holly House, a national historic landmark which is today anchors the Greenwich Historical Society's museum campus on the banks of the Koskov Harbor. <laughs> Establishing this groundbreaking digital catalog of Twachman's art at the Greenwich Historical Society is a virtual homecoming, bringing the artist's work back to the place that was most significant to him. To celebrate this remarkable achievement, we are honored to welcome Dr. Peters to deliver tonight's virtual talk, Twachman's Road to Greenwich. I now welcome Maggie Dimmock, Curator of Exhibitions and Programs at the Greenwich Historical Society, to moderate tonight's program and introduce Dr. Peters. Deborah, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and I would like to echo you in welcoming everyone who's joining us this evening, both from near and far. Um, I want to say it's really my pleasure to be able to get our program started this evening and introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Lisa Peters, the author of the John Henry Twachman Catalog Resume. The Twachman Catalog Resume, as Deborah mentioned, is the result of a collaboration between the Greenwich Historical Society and Dr. Peters. And it's offering detailed catalog entries for every known work by the artist John Henry Twachtman, along with a wealth of other resources that include biographical information, digitized correspondence, and hundreds of high quality digital images and photographs. Uh, it represents quite simply a life's worth of scholarship on the part of Dr. Peters. And now with the partnership of the Greenwich Historical Society, um, we're so pleased to be able to make the Twachman catalog resume freely accessible to researchers and art enthusiasts. Um, and this is something that, as Deborah mentioned, as the Greenwich Historical Society, we see as really extending our role as interpreters of the legacy of the Cos Cobb colony of American Impressionism, of which Twachman played such a major role. Um, I want to note, uh, before I introduce Lisa, that in addition to her authorship of the Twachman Catalog Resume, Lisa Peters is also the curator of the Greenwich Historical Society's upcoming exhibition, Life and Art, the Greenwich Paintings of John Henry Twachman, as well as the author of that exhibition's accompanying publication of the same title. Um, now, life and art, for those of you who are who are friends of the Greenwich Historical Society, you'll know that this is an exhibit that was set to take place this fall. Um, however, unfortunately, nature had other plans. Um, the Greenwich Historical Society un endured water damage following Hurricane Ida to our uh, museum and library building earlier in September, um, which thankfully for us didn't directly affect our exhibit galleries, but it did impact our collection storage areas and we're now embarking on a series of renovations and site work um, to repair and prevent any kind of future water incidents like that. So while we undergo those improvements, this exhibition that we are really looking forward to has
has been postponed. Um, the plans are now in motion to mount it in 2022. And certainly as we're coordinating those details, more information is going to be announced. So we'll look forward to that. So for tonight's program, uh, Dr. Peters has prepared a talk that's titled Twachtman's Road to Greenwich. Uh, it's going to offer a brief, but I think really rich look at the life of this distinctive artist as seen through some of his really indelible artworks. And I think that uh, Lisa will, through this exploration, provide us with not only an appreciation for Twachtman and his role in the story of American art, but also help us understand the narrative of his life, uh, which began in Cincinnati, Ohio, and then really culminated in his settling into his beloved home here in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, so just a few points of housekeeping before I introduce Lisa. Um, after uh, Lisa's talk, we will be doing a discussion and a question and answer uh, portion of this evening. So I'm going to invite everyone to submit your questions for Lisa using the Q&A function on this um, bottom of your Zoom window. And you're welcome to submit questions anytime throughout the lecture um, or during this discussion afterwards. Um, and just a note, since this is a webinar format, audience members won't actually be able to pose your questions live, but we are going to be receiving them. We'll take a look and I'll be posing them to, to Lisa um, on, the, on the webinar itself. Um, and of course, you can ask questions generally about Twachtman, his life, his work, or specifically about the uh, Twachtman catalog resume. Um, and then one last note, this recording, uh, or this program rather, is going to be recorded. And in the coming days, I think in fact tomorrow, we will be distributing an email with a link and information for how to access that recording. All right. So with those pieces of business taken care of, it's now my pleasure to be able to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Lisa Peters. Dr. Peters is an independent art historian and curator, uh, the author of the John Henry Twachtman Catalog Resume. She's curated exhibitions and published many articles and exhibition catalogs on Twachtman and other topics in, in American art, including John Henry Twachtman, an American Impressionist at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, and John Twachtman, a painter's painter at Spannerman Gallery. Lisa is a dedicated scholar who I've really had the pleasure of working with and getting to know over the past two years, and who I'm very, very pleased to give a warm welcome to speak now on Twachman's Road to Greenwich. Thank you, and looking forward to hearing your talk, Lisa. Thank you. Welcome all, and thank you, Deborah and Maggie, for your generous introductions and for organizing this event, which is the official public launch of the Twachtman Catalog Resume. I want to express my gratitude to the Greenwich Historical Society for making it possible for the Twachtman Catalog Resume to come to life. And it's been a, a pleasure to join with the Historical Society in this collaboration. I also want to thank my colleague, Susan Larkin, for her thoughtful and responsive consultation on the catalog and Susanna Shepherd of Panopticon, who helped me migrate my data from what was a very antiquated database to a program that's really multi, very multifaceted and state of the art, and who um, helped me to design the catalog's website. So projects like this can go on indefinitely, and sometimes it seemed as if this one certainly would. Um, it's nonetheless satisfying to be able to finally bring it to fruition and make it accessible. So now I will proceed to share my screen, which should just take a moment. Okay, so if you haven't already had a chance to access the website for the catalog, the login is simply jhtalkman.org, and you can also find it on the website of the Greenwich Historical Society. I think, I, I believe the catalog's usage is mostly self-explanatory, but I look forward to a point in the future when I can give a demonstration of it and um, 
show the, very, the various ways of navigating through it. However, tonight my focus is on uh, Twachman's art, and my approach is to consider just a few works that illustrate Twachman's road to Greenwich, relying on some discoveries that have come to light in the course of preparing the catalog resume, as well as in organizing the exhibition that will open at the Greenwich Historical Society next year. And this is just the, the cover of that catalog, uh, which has already been published in advance of the show, uh, which, as you know, was delayed. Now, of course, despite Twachman's many road scenes, the, the road in this talk's title is, is not an actual road, but one that represents Twachman's journey over the course of his career. So the question that I want to ask tonight in this, as I proceed, is, is basically why Greenwich? Uh, why was it in Greenwich that Twachman um, chose to settle and, and felt that Greenwich was not only the place that he could put down his roots and, and, and establish a place for his family, but also a place that he felt, in, he felt was his home. It uh, was the place that fulfilled him, and in a way, uh, a place uh, a place that that he felt was meant for him. Um, and essentially, the the story, which I will come to toward the end of this talk, is that from his first glimpse of Horseneck Falls, a Horseneck Brook winding through the rocky piece of land that he um, that he eventually purchased. He knew he had found what he had sought and what would bring him contentment. But what was the journey that brought him to Greenwich? What was the narrative arc in his life that led him to this destination and the sense of certainty that Greenwich gave him what he desired and that he turned into the place that really belonged to him and, and where he, he, put, he, he made his mark? So the first part of the story begins in Cincinnati, Ohio where Twachman was born in 1853 to German immigrant parents. And he grew up in the city's bustling German neighborhood of over the Rhine. There he, he was a middle sibling with two older sisters and an older brother and two younger sisters and a younger brother. And the few letters that we have indicate that he was to his family, indicate that he was close to his family, but he would be the only one to leave Cincinnati behind. And in his youth, he studied art locally and also worked with his father in a paper hanging manufacturing company. There his job was to paint designs on window shades. And later in his life, he found this amusing. He found it amusing to report to his friends that he began his career in a factory. The Cincinnati of Twachman's youth was a lively place with well-established music, art and craft traditions. And several noted artists began their careers there. But there were, and there were art patrons in the city, but their interests were mostly focused on foreign art and, and especially the melodramatic and highly detailed works of the German Dusseldorf School, which were very popular. Twachman felt early on that Cincinnati was a place where art and artists were not appreciated. And he also saw the city as a place consumed with its industrial growth and life rather than with the cultivation of the arts. Now, there are few images by Twachman of his early years in Cincinnati, but one painting, in one painting, um, he captured the industrial character of the city. And this painting was actually discovered in an obscure storage area at the, at the Philbrook Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 2005. And it has a date with an indistinct um, it has an indistinct date with a four on the end, which suggests that it probably dates from 1874, which is also uh, confirmed by the subject matter. In it, Twachman depicts his own neighborhood of over the Rhine, and from which the Rhine in the name that name was derived. Um, his his image captures the a view of the city. A view looking north um, from a bridge where he draws the viewer along the canal and the towpath through, through a zone in which built forms had overtaken the natural environment. 
There are, as you can see in these details, there are factories um, nestled at the base of the hills. If you follow along the towpath, um, there they are. And there's also a, a, an industrial complex on one of the hill crests, which suggests that more development is soon to come. In this image, Twachman broke from the type of landscape paintings for which Cincinnati was known and for which it had an established landscape tradition. Um, images in which artists uh, focus not on the city itself, but on its environs. And a, a couple examples are these works by Robert Duncanson and William Sontag, who, who brought out the pristine and pastoral character of the Little Miami River, which was a tributary of the Ohio. Their works were part of uh, a, a general view of Cincinnati, which was also um, re recorded in many literary sources, such as that of Harriet Martineau, who visited the city in 1838 and called it called the city a place of inexhaustible natural beauty. Thus, Twachman's painting is quite unusual, especially in an era in general when most American artists avoided the subject of modern American urban life, which they considered to be devoid of aesthetic interest. And in his image, he, he captures the real character of Cincinnati, which by the 1860s was one of the most densely populated places in the country. The city was located in the Ohio River Basin and surrounded by hills on all sides, and um, because it could not expand geographically, it was, it was a heavily polluted city. Hanging over the city was a, was a smoky pall from factories, mills, smokehouses, steamships, and the heating of homes with bituminous coal. And this aspect of the city is captured in an engraving that appeared in 1872 in Picturesque America, a guidebook to city and countryside locations across the nation, which con conveys that discrepancy between the green hills of Cincinnati and the, and the smoke just suffusing the valley below. In 1867, an article about Cincinnati in the Atlantic Magazine reported that a man could not touch his coat in Cincinnati without blackening his fingers. And Twachman himself alludes to that, to the city's miasma and the gray smoke-tinged sky in his Miami Canal view. At the same time, the lack of activity on the, on the water and on the towpath is indicative of the, the fact that the canal um, was in decline in the 1870s after railroads took over the role that had previously been fulfilled by canal barges. Twachman felt that his uh, that Cincinnati was a place where business came first and principally uh, one kind of business, that of pork packing. In an 1883 letter that he wrote to his close friend, J. Alden Weir, he called Cincinnati a hog sticking city. And he commented that about every other man from Cincinnati could not help going into the hog sticking business if he must make the city his home. And in fact, pigs were an everyday part of life in Cincinnati in, in the 19th century. They were raised on farms on the fringes of the city and often on the city streets. And they were in the fall, they were driven in by the thousands through the city streets to slaughterhouses. Um, and the city's nickname of Porkopolis was often used and meant to be at times derogatory, but it was also a source of pride to Cincinnatians. And in 1873, the Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce commissioned Henry Farney, who was an artist friend of Twachman's, to promote the city in drawings of the pork packing industry uh, to be displayed at the Vienna International Exposition, whose purpose was to demonstrate culture and education. And this is what was sent to represent Cincinnati. Uh, Farney was later on specialized in romantic and nostalgic images of Native American life. And here he exposed a, a gruesome and mechanized process, sometimes referred to as a disassembly line, um, that started with uh, killing, which constituted that, that hog sticking that, to which Twachman referred in his letter, and continued with cutting, rendering, and salting. However, Farney's drawings now unlocated were so well liked they were made into a widely distributed chromolithograph. In fact, Twachman alludes to the ubiquitous, ubiquitous place of pork in Cincinnati in his Miami Canal image. As a later photograph from roughly his perspective demonstrates, he, the, the, the square building in the middle distance was the Four and Ziegler pork and meat packing firm or one of, one of its predecessors 
um, on the side of the towpath are some piled up barrels and barrels were another one of Cincinnati's industries. They were used to hold brine that preserved fresh meat for transport. Thus, Twachman's painting of the Miami Canal suggests his view of a, his hometown as a place that was, was rather bleak and, he, and suggests his, his attitude toward his city as a place that was lacking culturally. And so this was in a, in a way, the first step in his narrative arc of wanting something else, wanting something more uplifting and more inspirational. And his opportunity to broaden his horizons occurred in 1875. Um, in that winter, he was able to participate in an art class taught by Frank Duvenek, who was originally from Kentucky, uh, Covington, Kentucky, which is just across the river, uh, across the Ohio River from Cincinnati. Dumanek had a veneer of worldliness and success um, because he was just back from a period of study in Munich and the works he produced there had brought him acclaim. In them, he united aspects of contemporary French and German realism, which were prevalent in Munich at the time, with a dark painterly style influenced by the art of old masters such as Hals and Velasquez. And you can see these, these two influences coming together in his Whistling Boy of 1872. Duvenek opened up a new world of opportunity to Twachman, kind of opened his eyes and to possibilities. And when Duvenek returned to Munich in August 1875, Twachman went with him along with Farney, whose opinion of Cincinnati concurred with Twachman's. When Farney was quoted in an 1874 article, he stated that Cincinnati was about the worst place for a large city that a young artist could choose to make his debut in. He said, there is not much attention given to aesthetic culture by the public at large, and unless an artist takes to designing tobacco labels, oyster label, labels, theatrical bills, or such work as that, he will generally find it hard to make a living. At the same time, even growing up in a city in the Midwest, Twachman felt the lure that was overtaking a younger generation of American artists in the era to seek training and experience in Europe. Whereas artists of a previous generation were focused on the American scene, on building up the nation's nation as having a distinct identity and reputation in their art. After the Civil War, they turned away from this, or the, art, the new generation of artists turned away from this preoccupation and from a need to define America as a, a separate and unique place from Europe. Um, and this, in it, and the, the view that they were breaking away from was that of the Hudson River School artists who created images of wilderness sea areas ready to be cultivated and pastoral places where nature and human involvement in the land were in a peaceful, harmonious balance. As in these examples by Thomas Cole and Jasper Cropsey, as well as in the Cincinnati version of this kind of image of heaping praise on what America had to offer in, in its unsullied places, by contrast with the landscape of Europe, where there was little left of nature un, uh, that was undefiled, un, tran, trampled on. And in going to Munich with Duvenek, Twachman joined hordes of American artists who now saw the native art artistic tradition as out of step with a country torn apart by the devastation of the Civil War, and one that was insular and, and provincial. What they wanted to do was join their art to that of Europe and its great artistic traditions. And they felt this would enable them to make up for a, a perceived American provincialism. Um, and they felt that to move forward, they needed to, what they needed to do was to absorb a knowledge of European art, both of the past and of the present. In the 1870s, Munich was a place um, where artists gravitated to for that purpose. Um, and, and, and especially uh, many artists from Cincinnati who had some familiarity with, uh, with the German language. So it felt more natural for them to go there. At, but also at that time, Munich was vying with Paris as, as a leading um, European art center because Paris was still recovering from the Franco-Prussian War. And Munich, had what Munich had to offer was a, a major and great art academy uh, where painting techniques were stressed. 
and an art scene stimulated by a group of German realists and their leader, Wilhelm Leibel, whose influence rubbed off on the art student population. The city was an awakening for Twachman with its grandeur in museums, opening his eyes to a realm of culture and new art influences. And he enrolled at the Munich Academy of Fine Arts. And, and there, and while he was in Munich, he remained close to Duvenet. The two artists visited a Munich photography studio together and their camaraderie is reflected in these photos that they each had taken uh, where they both assumed very serious expressions and, ex and inscribed their carte de visite images in the same way. And while he was in Munich, Twachman sent letters home to his niece in Cincinnati, which demonstrates that he remained close to his family. And he sent a couple amusing drawings of the pipe that he smoked after dinner and, and two sketches of his two Munich teachers um, signing off uh, from, from your far off uncle, John. By Twachman concluded his European visit with a trip to Venice with, with Duvenek and William Merritt Chase that lasted from the spring of 1877 through much of 1878. And by the time he reached Venice, he had developed a new dynamic realist style influenced by his time in Munich. Um, at first, actually in 1877, he worked in a rather conventional style with tight detail and a panoramic type of composition that looked back to the Vedute traditions of Venetian painting in the 18th century, such as the image at the top of the screen. However, soon he was rendering his works alla prima, which means all at once in single painting sessions. Um, standing on piers and bridges, he worked directly and left smudges and swirls of impostoed paint on his finished canvases. And that was in 1878, and, and, the, and as in the example at the bottom of the screen here. His aim was to preserve the freshness of his firsthand experiences in his art as a means of making it clear that his art was original rather than based on pre-established uh, art artistic conventions. He wanted to show that this is, this is how he saw Venice and not looking at it through the lens of, of artistic um, imagery from the past. In Venice, he depicted steamers and, and cargo ships on, uh, on the Grand Canal representing modern life. And thus his works departed from the romantic images of the city painted by other artists of his era who showed Venice as a poetic and ethereal spectacle. Um, what they were trying to do was evoke the grandeur and beauty of a past age. And there, that type of image of a poeticized Venice um, stands in contrast with Twachman's uh, very quickly rendered um, images that, that capture what he experienced um, with, with a, a sense of immediacy. Most artists in Venice stuck to the rendering of famous Venetian vistas featuring recognizable palaces and churches, but Twachman sought his subject matter in out of the way places that tourists did not visit. Um, he represented what James McNeil Whistler would describe in 1880 as a Venice in Venice that other artists never seemed to have perceived, except of course, Vet Whistler himself. But Twachman did perceive it and he did so a year before Whistler made his only visit to Venice. And interestingly, both artists used um, the, uh, their, their experiences of laundry drying from Venetian windows as, as compositional elements in their work that you know, sort of draw your eye in and, and, and are not just a, 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 de, a, a descriptive detail, but part of compositions, their compositions themselves. And, um, and both traveled to the far Western tip of Venice to a square where fishermen lived, Campo Santa Marta, and created images, Whistler in a pastel and Twachman in a painting that are, very, are from a very similar vantage point. In Venice, Twachman was on a journey to find and establish his artistic identity. He did this in his art by capturing what caught his eye and framing his works around what interested him aesthetically 
rather than an, on a criteria based on how Venice should look and what its beauty should consist of. And critics acknowledged and saw this and praised this aspect of his art when he sent Venetian scenes to the first exhibitions at, of the Society of American Artists in New York in 1878 and 1879. And the critics pronounced his work as expressive of the real Venice, not, the fair, not a fairy tale version of the city. In the next 10 years, Twachman's journey consisted of opening his eyes to and absorbing influences from many aspects of European art, and he traveled to Europe three more times. In between these trips, he established his place in the New York art world and formed many abiding friendships, the most important of which was with, with Weir. And here are images of the two friends who shared such a sincere and true affection and kinship throughout their, from the moment they met through the end of at least Twachman's life um, in 1902. Nonetheless, Twachman remained a resident of Cincinnati where he married fellow artist Martha Scudder in 1881 and where their first child Alda named for Weir was born in 1882. In Cincinnati in these years, Twachman strengthened his determination to leave his hometown for good. He wrote to Weir in 1882, in Cincinnati one naturally falls into a state of doing nothing. He commented sarcastically, a good many people, all of them supposed to be up in art matters, have seen my paintings, but I'm convinced they care little for them. Noting that only one kind of art was considered good in Cincinnati, that of the finicky Dusseldorf school that I showed examples of earlier, he stated, this is a very old foggy place and I shall be glad to leave. Foggy here may be an inadvertent pun in which Twachman was conflating the city's pollution with a reference to an old fogey, um, a, a kind of overly conservative person with old fashioned ideas. The next phase in Twachman's development was his French period, which began in the fall of 1883 when he traveled with his wife and son to Paris. Paris was almost an obligatory place for American artists to study and visit in the late 19th century. And while Twachman was drawn by the desire to spend time in a great city of art and culture, um, following the example of many of his um, contemporaries, uh, and Paris was really the center of the art world by the early 1880s, he also went to Paris and his main reason for going to Paris was to study figural drawing. He felt he had not received training in this area in Munich and, and as he reported in, in, a, in a letter to Weir, he hadn't, there had been no drawing, drawing training in Munich and he felt he hadn't learned anything there. Um, when he, by the time he arrived in Paris, he was not a young student anymore. He was 30 years old. And at the time he had a wife and a son, um, but he applied, applied himself with great seriousness to his studies. As a younger fellow student reported, there were, in, in Twachman, there was no consciousness of superiority as he was a student among students anxious to gain his store of skill and knowledge from every available source. In Paris in June of 1884, the couple welcomed their second child, their daughter Marjorie. And this photograph taken in a Cincinnati photography studio is of Martha and the first two Twachman children, five of whom survived to adulthood, including these two. How Twachman's art changed and what he attained in this French period is demonstrated in this comparison of one of his Venetian images with a painting he created in Holland in the summer of 1885, toward the end of his French period. Instead of the strong contrast of dark and light, as in his Venetian works, he, he now was using a palette of closely modulated silvery tones with which he um, expressed a sense of the scene's quiet, the, this scene's quietude. And, and at the same time, the painting reflects new influences on him. He was looking at examples from Dutch in Dutch landscape paintings, um, stretching from the Baroque era through the Hague School. And this is evident in his attention to the interconnectedness of all the elements in the natural world that he brought out in this work, the way the atmospheric light was reflected on the, the water in the foreground and um, the and, and various textures that he was now differentiating that he hadn't paid as much attention to in his Venetian works. And he, he also 
sought a, a more of a sense of overall tonal harmony um, in the painting, the kind of tonal, tonal consistency that made it a, an aesthetic totality. And in that respect, he was influenced by the work of James McNeil Whistler. And he used a method uh, similar to Whistler of, of painting thinly and softly so that his pigments essentially seep into the, the weave of his canvases. And so he eliminates the barrier of his paint so you, the, for the viewer to get caught up in the paint, but instead to become more engaged with the scene itself as if, as if it's not a painted thing, but an experience of, of nature itself to be interacted with directly in its, in its rhythms and nuances. And uh, this painting suggests his, his desire to merge himself with the place he painted. His site in windmills can be identified as an estuary to the south of Dordrecht that was the uh, formed by the confluence and flooding of the Rhine and Meuse rivers. And we know this location because he exhibited the work as Hollandish Deep um, in 1886 at his solo exhibition held at Jaysman Chase's gallery in Boston at that time. Nonetheless, despite our being able to pinpoint the site, I realized in working on the catalog resume that the painting is actually composite, uh, which is a compare, parent in a comparison of it with, with two pastels, which reveal that Twachman produced it by reusing and combining their different elements as my red arrows point out. And you can see how he kind of dragged over various aspects of the two pastels to create a, a, a composition that had the, the, that united them together into the, the, the more um, sophisticated a, a result that he wanted to achieve. And he only used this kind of synthetic process during his French period and only for his most important works of that time, um, because otherwise he was committed to, pl to plan air painting throughout his career, working directly in the outdoors, even if he did do some touch up of his works in his studio. Nonetheless, this does not take away from what Twachman sought, which was not to describe the scene, but to create an evocative and suggestive image that engaged the viewer in a process, in a process of observation. And critics recognized this, actually saw this in 1886. One began a review by describing the scene's features, noticing its, its depiction of several windmills vanishing off in the uh, vanishing into the distance, a low sandy marsh in the foreground where a slow river winds off in the right. But then the, the critic sort of paused mid, in mid, you know, midway in the article, um, realizing that he or she had made a great mistake in the recognition that Twachman did not care for the things he painted, per se, um, that he painted, he, what he painted was not what he was interested in was not a truth to the form of nature, but to the truth of his impression. In other words, he wanted to, to bridge the gap between himself and his subject matter. In another article um, that uh, was a kind of recent discovery, the artist Susan Hale recounted a conversation she overheard at the exhibition between two women, who, and, and she reported it um, in the article, the, the two women who were perplexed and dismissive uh, of what they saw. Um, one said, what are those things anyway? And the second one said, Twachman, who is he? Twachman? How do you pronounce him? I wonder, because Twachman's name is often mispronounced. And I imagine that's how these two women um, stated, pronounced it. Never heard of him. What are they about? Nor I. Perfectly horrid, are they not? Look at this windmill. See, there is another windmill. I wonder what that large one is, we cannot see it. So many people are in front of it. And I loved finding this article um, for its, its firsthand rec experience of what it was like, as if you could kind of go back in time and eavesdrop on these women um, at the exhibition itself. And uh, no doubt the painting around which the crowd had gathered that the people were standing in front of was the large and immersive windmills of 1885. So that, that puts you in a way back in time at that exhibition, looking at that painting. 
Um, by contrast, Hale, Hale went on, and by contrast with these flummoxed and, and derisive women, she reported on a much more perceptive friend who told her, I think you'll like these pictures if you spend a good while looking at them. And Hale agreed. She visited the show repeatedly and then advised readers at the end of her article, if you go to see the things, look at them carefully, and then if you like, look closely at them to see how they are done. What Hale sheds light on here is the gap in the perception of Talkman's work between the, the often the general public who couldn't appreciate it and the deep admiration for it that, that artists felt for it. And this essentially throughout Talkman's career, there was this kind of a split. Um, often critics uh, stated that in, Talk, in Talkman's work, he was striving for nobler things. Um, for something that went beyond the comprehension of a person who, who didn't want to engage with, with art, didn't want to expand themselves in any way. And uh, they, they said that his work was beyond the scope of the Philistine, uh, which is considered to be a person indifferent to culture who just wants to get things right away and doesn't, doesn't, want, to, uh, doesn't want to go further. further. In his French period works, Twachman strove for a kind of transcendence in which the painting was a vehicle for a higher level of experience, one of refinement and beauty beyond the humdrum realm of the noise and distractions of everyday life. He desired places that could give him a way of being in touch with his feelings, uh, which is a kind of spirituality where you go beyond yourself to beyond the moment and, and it's sort of like meditation to feel something uh, in, in a kind of pure way. Windmills played an actual role in Twachman's progression toward Venet, Greenwich. In 1888, he exhibited the work with its current title at the Society of American Artists. And there it won the Webb Prize for the best painting in the show by an artist under the age of 40. And this recognition provided Twachman with a new confidence. Um, that he could make it in New York and thus could finally leave Cincinnati behind, that he could settle elsewhere and, um, and, 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 and be able to establish himself. And in Cincinnati in 1886, still in Cincinnati in 1886, Martha had given birth to the couple's third child, Elsie. And like so many ambitious women artists of the era, she abandoned her artistic aspirations to take on a domestic role. For Twachman, by this time, traveling in Europe no longer made sense. On the one hand, he had his family to consider, and on the other, he had fulfilled his desire to widen his perspective on life, absorbing and taking in and openly embracing all that he could of new experiences, places, and influences. Through this process, he came to know himself and what was important to him, which was finding in his art what he felt to be personally meaningful because it resonated with him. Nonetheless, financial constraints kept him um, stateside and having to make a living. And out of a need to support his family, he joined a group of fellow artists from Cincinnati and Munich in the painting of cycloramas, which are historical scenes in the round that were essentially the, the reality, the virtual reality of, of the era. And on the screen is a photo in the upper left of a group of artists working, um, who worked on the Civil War Battle of Gettysburg, which was installed in the, the city of St. Paul. And here they are sitting against um, one of the, their, their paintings and looking as if they're, they're within the painting itself. And also some, just some images of these cyclorama scenes, which no longer exists and the brochures that accompanied them. Now this work took Twachman to various places, to Chicago and Philadelphia, along with St. Paul. And when he was in Philadelphia in 1887, Weir visited the city and saw Twachman and then, and then proceeded to write a letter to his brother, John, in which he, in which he told John that Twachman at that time had vowed never to go back west to live. And Weir remarked to his brother that he thought this was a wise decision, that Twachman had, had made a, a, a decision to make a break from his hometown that he could do that. And soon thereafter, he stepped up his efforts to facilitate such a move. Um, in March 1888, he organized a three day solo show of his art at the Art Students League as if to announce that he had arrived in New York. 
In February 1889, he and Weir arranged the show and auction of their work at the newly established Fifth Avenue Art Galleries. The exhibition received favorable reviews, and, and it was a success. It generated a profit of $7,500 that the two artists split, and that put some much needed funds in Talkman's, Talkman's pocket. In today's terms, this would have been about $200,000 total for the 84 works that sold. And in the winter of 1889, still attempting to get his, you know, to get, to, to, to get his place situated, get himself situated in New York, Twachman taught a class at the Art Students League on a trial basis. And that fall, he was offered a permanent position and became the League's instructor of preparatory antique drawing, in which he taught beginning students to draw from casts of hands and feet, which you can see in this wonderful illustration of students uh, scrutinizing these, these casts. And such work was really antithetical to Twachman's own and drudgery for him, but he maintained this role for the remainder of, of his life. So the last prelude to Twachman's Greenwich move and art is represented in this pastel, which sold at the Fifth Avenue Art Galleries as Neath Summer Skies, but it was later returned to the Twachman family where it remains today. Twachman created it while spending the summer of 1888 with his family in a home they rented near that of his close friend, J. Alden Weir, in the Southern Connecticut town of Branchville, which um, is 60 miles Northeast of New York City. There Weir had obtained his home, which is seen here on 153 acres in 1882 from a collector in exchange for a painting. And while there during that summer, Weir and Twachman spent their days roaming together over a countryside of upland, upland meadows and old farms that provided them with interesting compositional opportunities and, and gave them joy in being together in the process of, of discovering them. They worked directly on etching plates and printed their similar images in, in Weir's barn. They also created pastels on the spot and the medium's portability, at, medium is, very, is portable, you can carry it around and it's, it had the, the crayon sticks of pastel um, and their, their bright colors aided Twachman in transitioning from the silvery grays of his French period to the vibrant palette of his Greenwich art. Although earlier in his career, Twachman often depicted sites from one viewpoint, he explored this approach with uh, quite deliberately during the summer of 1888 in Branchville. And I came to this realization in noticing that two oils on panel that are on panel feature the same locale as in the pastel Neath Summer Skies. In each work, Twachman recorded how his angle of vision changed what he noticed, providing him with unique aesthetic considerations. Um, and in Neath Summer Skies, you'll notice that there's a, a cross axial composition that has a push-pull effect. The artist's gaze is on a diagonal toward the buildings, which he marked with the bracket of two curving vertical trees that draw your eye sort of on an arrow in that direction, whereas the road, um, is, it counters that, it goes in the opposite, it forms a an op opposing diagonal. And the, the pastel was perhaps a way that Twachman was coping with a transitional um, turning point in his life when he was unsure if he would keep going down the road or if he would find a permanent place to settle down um, and, and be rooted in one place. His Branchville images suggest his understanding, which is essential to an impressionist point of view, that an individual's subjective perspective determines the reality in a work of art. What this means is that he understood truth to be something that existed in his own perceptual experience rather than something existing inherently in nature itself. And his viewpoint departs from that in early American landscape paintings in which artists show the natural world as God's visible creation with the truth therefore existing inherently within it. And that was external to human perception. So you can see that Church's painting is from a God's eye perspective as God sees the landscape rather than as, as church did, as if he were, uh, in, unless he was standing at some very elevated point, um, it, it's, he still couldn't encompass the entirety of this scene. So um, the, different, the difference in the attitude 
and 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 what churches is, is conveying is that um the 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 natural world is is a visible creation is god's visible creation with the truth existing in it um on its own the the two artists landscape demonstrate um the the difference in this attitude is demonstrated in comparison of church's new england scenery of 1851 with talkman's view of new england in neat summer skies church's painting is a composite from sketches he made in many different locations which he united to present a, a kind of idealized view um, of new of new england showing it as a kind of version of the garden of eden in which cultivation and mountain scenery blend together harmoniously in pastels such as Meet Summer Skies, Talkman captured typical New England scenery, and, and his works such as this work were praised by critics for expressing the spirit of the American landscape. But his aim was to convey his personal responses to his sites, rather than to credit their features to a divine um, overarching presence and thereby impose values on them. By creating multiple views of the same subject, Twachman explored how scenes affected him and how he contributed to their reality through the way he saw and portrayed them. His approach was in a sense, a form of mindfulness, a being aware, not just of what he was seeing, but of how he was seeing it. Even though Weir spent winters in New York City and mostly used Branch Branchville as a summer home, Twachman could see from Weir's example, how living in one place and observing it from multiple perspectives could be fulfilling enabling the recognition and self-awareness that comes from looking at a site from different angles in different moments of time and 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 in different and and when experienced differently taking this cue from where twarkman began to look for a countryside home within range of new york city um, and to this end in 18 in the fall of 1889 he rented a cottage in central greenwich from which he could explore the area's opportunities from there, he traveled a couple miles north and came upon a piece of property on Round Hill Road through which Horseneck Brook wound. And he felt an immediate connection with it and purchased a home on three acres of rocky uncultivated land in February, 1890. By the end of the following year, he owned 17 acres and his property crossed over Horseneck Brook. Throughout the 10 years that followed, his Greenwich home and land provided him with what he, need, what he needed both artistically and personally. He loved his domestic life with his wife and children. He took joy in damming a section of the brook to create a swimming and boating pond for his children. He painted his wife relaxing with the garden around her, his intimate vantage point suggesting his affection for her. The subject he especially loved painting was his home, which he modified over the years, showing it from the north and south. And he often reused the same view as a means of mindful self-awareness. For the uncupping show at the Greenwich Historical Society, we formed a team to determine the chronology of the changes Twachman made over the years to his home, which is privately owned today. And our many findings are included in the show's catalog. Twachman did not date his art after 1883, and our discoveries helped assign new dates to many of his Greenwich works. In Greenwich, Twachman featured his home along with his land, and he cre created images of his property that he shaped himself with trees he planted, a garden, paths, and stone walls. He loved Horseneck Brook, capturing each aspect of it as it changed in movement and form during the different seasons. And he returned often to its hemlock pool, a rock-bound part of the brook, and the brook's many cascades, including the largest, which was known as Horseneck Falls, and depicted here in the two paintings on the far right side of the screen. During his Greenwich years, Twachman taught a summer school along with Weir at the Holly House, an inn in Coscob, which was a short distance from his home. There his instruction was an outdoor painting, which made this experience satisfying and enjoyable by contrast with his taxing days at the Art Students League. The Holly House, which is now part of the Greenwich Historical Society, um, and it, it pictured on the, on the screen on the upper left, and as Deborah mentioned, was, it was really a second home for Twachman. There he was welcomed by the Holly, Holly family and the spirited community they helped to foster of artists and writers. The support of nearby Costco amplified the satisfaction Twachman felt in Greenwich and he often invited his students to visit him and his family at his Greenwich home. 
on his home grounds themselves, he derived inspiration from the deepening experience of a place that comes from being familiar with it. And he did not need, feel a need to seek inspiration elsewhere. Because of the personal attachment he had to a subject matter, he could express much more than, he, than what he observed, conveying a spiritual aspect, a connection beyond the facts of his ownership of the land, home and land into a realm of feeling and meaning. Even if Twachman's path to Greenwich was not preset or inevitable, it was the narrative arc of his life, it, the narrative arc of his life and career brought him to his piece of land alongside Round Hill Road. As in his French period, Twachman's Greenwich image have a slow impact, enabling the viewer to enter into them interactively, but you must do so on a gradual basis because seeing them all at once, you, you, you miss a, 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 the deeper experience that they afford. For example, you might see one of his hemlock pool scenes in a certain way, but on taking the time to look again, new dimensions and distinctions begin to emerge. The paintings therefore evoke self-reflection on our part. They make us conscious of ourselves, uh, while they enable us to realize that our first impressions can be deceptive and that, and that what we see at first is not what we see when we look again. When we look anew, we see more. They thus imply the idea that we should not judge something on face value, be too rigid in our assumptions and always keep an open mind. And I think this was part of Tarquin's belief system and for which he found great satisfaction in Greenwich in, in the understanding that there's always more to see and you can never, therefore, you're, because experience is such a constantly changing phenomenon, um, you can't take something in all at once. And, and I think what he, this was part of what his belief system in, in Greenwich was to express that infinity of experience that comes from continuing to look and take something in and being open to uh, what the, the, the new, new opportunities and, and feelings it evokes and, and, and provides the longer you engage with it. In Cincinnati, Twachman experienced an environment and culture that he felt was alien to who he was. Leaving Cincinnati, he opened himself to what he could learn through travel, new exposure to new artistic influences, while also seeking to create works that enabled him to get in touch with his internal life and needs, and giving him the ability to capture the feelings that his sights evoked, the transcendent realm that is undefinable and therefore spiritual. The stability and constancy of his home grounds in Greenwich enabled him to capture nuances of subjective difference, of how he subjectively experienced places um, anew each time he, um, he, he took the time, each time he explored them. As one critic remarked in 1892, in subjects Twachman found at his own door, he made so much of so little. By modifying his home and land, Twachman also brought the world around him into conformity with how he wished to see it, uniting life and art and achieving a sense of ideal completeness as if he was living within his own work of art um, and so that nothing was left out. And that gave him a sense of, of, total, uh, of total contentment. Twachman's life was cut short. He died suddenly at age 49, three years after he had to vacate and rent out his Greenwich home. And for financial reasons. And this must have been wrenching for him. Um, he didn't know at the time that he would not return to the place he loved, but it, it still must have been a, a powerful sense of loss on having to step away from the property that he had been so much a part of him. However, during 10 years in Greenwich, he attained satisfaction, a satisfaction that can elude people throughout their lives expressing who he was and what he created and preserving this experience for posterity in his art. Just as a, um, a follow-up, I want to mention that when the, to follow up to this talk, when the show opens at the Greenwich Historical Society next fall, I will give another talk in which I will provide more in-depth consideration of Twachman's 
Greenwich works and comparing them to the paintings created by Claude Monet at his home in the Normandy village of Giverny and looking at these two artists in very different careers, et cetera, but how they both probed in some similar ways, the nature and meaning of familiarity in their work. Uh, but for now, I will bring Maggie back on the screen so she can moderate the rest of the program and field some questions. Great. Well, Lisa, I wanted to say thank you so much um, for bringing us on that journey through Twachman's life. I mean, I have to say, you know, just um, reflecting on, on your talk here, for me, you know, having been able to work with you um, over the last two years so much on this topic of, of Twachman in Greenwich, I mean, it's really rewarding to return to some of these artworks over and over again, especially having spent time with you, you know, returning to those actual paths that Twachman himself walked, you know, around especially the, the, uh, the waterfalls, the horse neck brook. Um, and I'm really struck by this idea that you brought up um, of Twachman kind of returning to these subjects over and over through the different seasons as almost a practice of mindfulness. And I think that that's something that, that I certainly can, can relate to having returned to those spaces over and over with, with you. Yes, and that experience for me over the years of going back during the seasons and, and seeing the property in, 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 in different, from different perspectives. Um, it's really how, no matter how many times I've been there, it's always a magical experience in being in, in the spots that Twachman painted. And there's a kind of a double experience in that, that you can appreciate them on their own terms. And then where you, when you stand where Twachman did, you also see them as he did. And that in a sense puts you in the painting. Uh, and so that even though he had to leave his home and he was only in Greenwich for 10 years, he kept his presence al there alive in, in his art. And I also just want to mention that it's it's so fortunate that his home and, and its surroundings are intact today to make that experience possible. And that is thanks uh, to the home's current owner, John Nelson, who loves the Twachman home and Twachman surrounding as Twachman did and really sees that piece of ground through Twachman's eyes. Um, and it's been an incredible benefit to consult with John and visit with him at the Twachman home over the years. And he's often been able to pinpoint a site that was elusive, that, you know, and that he found exactly the spot that Twachman stood and all of a sudden that painting would just come to life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I have to echo that. And I really certainly have to thank um, our friend John for introducing, introducing me and really many people, I think, to um, Twachman's world. Um, we're really fortunate to, to have someone like him who's the steward of that property. Um, so Lisa, I think what I'm going to do is get our kind of discussion portion of the evening started. And I will just do another reminder to those who are watching, um, you can submit your questions using the Q&A function here on the Zoom screen, um, your questions for Lisa, and I'll be able to pose them to her. Uh, but just to go ahead and jump into it here, I wanted to, uh, you know, talk a little bit about Twachman's Greenwich paintings in more detail. And one thing, you know, you've mentioned that his, uh, the paintings that Twachman made of his home um, here in Greenwich really represent the height of his impressionistic style. Um, and among art historians and collectors today, it's certainly those impressionistic paintings that are among his best known or his best appreciated. Uh, I wonder if maybe you could give us a sense about whether that was an opinion that would have been shared by the critics in Twachman's time. Well, yes, um, it was, in fact, unlike some situations where you only have um, a kind of perspective from hindsight, the critics did fully recognize Twachman as a leading American Impressionist in his day, and they appreciated his work for its truthfulness, its suggestiveness, its immersive qualities. Um, they, they felt that he really captured a, a sense of place and mood where you could, you could follow the brook or, or touch the wetness of snow or feel the mist sort of surrounding you. Um, and many critics felt that Twachman what the, was the closest American counterpart to Claude Monet, although they felt his work was distinctive in its refinement and its subtlety and its quietude. 
So he, he, you know, in talking about Monet, I mean, it sounds as though he was recognized specifically as an Impressionist artist in his time. I mean, was he kind of aware of that recognition? I uh, guess he actually was fully aware of it and he accepted it and embraced it. He was very proud to be in a four artist exhibition with Monet in 1893. And, and he was very, he was rather defensive about impressionism in, in the era in the 1890s, there were a number of American critics who criticized impressionism as a kind of superficial style that only captured fleeting effects in nature and didn't demonstrate something enduring such as in tonalist art. And, um, Twachman felt that Impressionism was a style that could be um, of the reality of the moment and also a poetic experience. And it's something interesting occurred to me when I was going through some newly digitized newspapers and I found an article in an Indianapolis newspaper from 1894 in which I felt that Twachman had come back to life because he was quoted in this letter um, in which he said that um, he felt there was just as much poetry in sunshine as in darkness and the paintings didn't need a sunset or a moon to be poetic. And in that, I think he was referring somewhat derisively to, to tonalism. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, he thought, he thought Impressionism wasn't even a time-bound style. And he felt that it went back to the writings of the lavender sunsets, that lavender light in the, not sunsets, but in the writings of Homer. Wow. I mean, he, you know, I think of Twachman as being this, you know, I, you get the impression that he was a, a soulful person, a reflective person. And, and you know, what I think about a lot is a phrase that um, people often repeat, um, I think you yourself have as well, of, of referring to Twachman as an artist's artist or a painter's painter. And I wonder if you can sort of give us a sense of what that may have meant you know, first of all, was that something that, that came out of Twachman's lifetime itself, or is it more of something that was assigned to him after the fact, or, or what does that really, what does that mean for Twachman specifically? Well, actually, from the beginning of his career, even early on, he was called an artist's artist, and, the, and in the literature, uh, he was referred to in that way, mm -hmm. and um, he, you know, it was acknowledged in that he was more understood by artists than by the public, and I think that that quote, the, the the women at the exhibition kind of point that mm -hmm. that out that 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 difference, um, and and the fact is that that Twachman it's because Twachman really couldn't paint conventional works. He couldn't paint to please patrons or or the public at large. He he could only paint for himself. He couldn't bend himself in new directions. And as his friend Thomas Dewing said, he 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 could not. He never composed just to fill a space. He didn't paint what people wanted to see or as they expected to see something. So that if he saw clouds below the horizon line, that's how he painted them, reflected in a pond rather than just up in the sky. Um, and, and because his work isn't, you know, isn't easy at times, it, he, he, as a result, he sold a few works during his lifetime and he, he struggled financially. Um, yeah, well, and I think I was under the impression that that some of his friends, especially those, you know, who may have been more financially successful were were often extending a hand to help him out. Is that right? Yes. In fact, they really did care for him and worried about him and felt they that he needed their their help. And at times they secretly purchased his work so that he could think he'd sold a work to a patron. Um, and they, they saw him very early on as a modern artist and predicted that he would only receive his due recognition in the future. And that actually turned out to be the case. It's ironic given how, you know, how Twachman struggled to, to make a, a sale, only sold one painting to a museum in his lifetime to the Cincinnati Art Museum, um, that after his death, his works were avidly purchased by museums so that in the 1920s it was reported that it was very rare for a, a work by Twachman to appear on the market. And I think that that's because his work remained, um, fit in more with modernism than that of other American Impressionists for which there was kind of a lessening of interest. And he was, he was much admired by many modernists including mm -hmm. Arthur Dove, Marston Hartley, Milton Avery, and, and John Maron.
Yeah, no, I think I think knowing that legacy is is so interesting and it kind of gives you a, a, a different way of looking at Twachman and his work, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, do you know, so I, I think, Lisa, we've got some questions coming in. I wanted to just sort of pose, I think, one more one more question that we had talked about, um, which um, is shifting gears just a little bit to talk a little more about the catalog resume as a project. Um, and I think that, you know, just to give you a chance to talk about your own experience. I mean, you've been researching Twachtman and his work for you know years now. And with the, I think the fruits of that labor are completely evident in both the, the breadth and the depth of information that's in contained within the catalog resume as a resource. But I wonder, you know, I mean, when you study somebody for that amount of time, I mean, do you does it get old? Does it get boring? I mean, are you, I think that the one thing I, I love talking about is, is whether or not you still end up coming across new discoveries. I wonder if you could speak about that a little bit. Well, it's, it has been a long process and with some painters it might get old, but I was very lucky in choosing Twagman as a, as a subject because like his work, the more you look, the more you see in studying his work, more angles emerge and there's always something new to discover. There's always the moment where I suddenly realize connections or what the site was or what where something fits in. Um, and and discoveries sometimes even emerge when they're unexpected. And I'll just give an example of one such situation. Um, there was always a puzzle about Twachman's paintings of the white bridges over Horseneck Brook as to whether, because the bridges all look different in, in the, his different paintings, and whether he just took liberties with them, whether he was, that was something he kind of made up in his art because that fit his compositions. Mm -hmm. But um, what happened, and I will ask Ma Maggie if you can put up on the screen the letter. Um, sure, that, yeah, I had this uh, pulled up because we yeah. were speaking about it. So what happened is that I contacted an archivist at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts looking for something else and he came up with a previously unknown letter um, in which Twachman wrote to the museum director in 1897, indicating that the painting he was sending to the annual that year was of a different and a new bridge than in the painting he'd sent the year before. And this explained how seasonally he'd actually rebuilt the, the bridge and, and that in turn cast light on his paintings in the Art Institute of Chicago and the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, which you can see they're, they're linked to the letter on the, on the site. So you can go from the letter to its content. And so that also shed light, not only in those paintings, helping to date them, but on their sites and the whole history of his property in general. So all at once, many questions were answered. And that's, that had a kind of, so it had a kind of cascading effect to use a, a Twachman word, relevant word. And you know there have been many other amazing moments like that over the years that I've been able to include in the catalog, and I hope more will emerge in the future. Um, I, I look forward to that. Yeah. Well, I think I mean it's there's nothing like being able to kind of go directly to the source and being able to not only sort of view the transcript of a piece of correspondence like that, but actually you know see Twachman's handwriting, see the digitized letter. I think it's great. I mean, I love I love how you know sort of straightforward he is. You know, I, I not only have I sent you a new painting, uh, but I also built a new bridge. You know, just very right, forward. right. And he's very cordial in his tone. He wishes the director a happy new year. Um, and he tells him that he can change the name of the painting that's exhibited. And for an artist who was not very careful with titles that, you know, <laughs> it's pretty typical. Um, he could change the painting if he likes. So it didn't have the same name as the painting shown in the previous year. Mm -hmm. So Lisa, I think I'm just looking at what time it is and I'd love to bring in a couple of audience questions because we do have some good ones. Um, so one, one I think is something that clearly um, I think is interesting for people. Um, you know, we, I think this comes up a lot with visitors who are, who are sort of hearing about Twachman and his legacy when they visit us at the Historical Society. And that is that um, sadly he did, he, he died quite young. You know, he mentioned he was only 49, it was 1902. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could give us a little bit of that kind of, um, you know, what we know in a bit of a nutshell about, you know, his, his, the end of his life and especially his family afterwards, you know, how long they, they spent in that property in Greenwich um, and what the kind of scope of, of their story was. 
Well, he was in Gloucester when he died and it was very sudden and he he had been apart from his family because his son was studying in Paris um, at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts and the family, the rest of the family went with him. So they were not with, they were not with him during those last three years of his life. And I think it was a tough time for him. Um, but from all, from what I've, all indications is that it wasn't, it happened suddenly. So um, and the family did then come back to the house and lived there um, through the 1930s and his son Alden um, lived in the house, house next door. So, and then he and another brother were built a lot of the homes in Greenwich. They, they were architects. So they left a, a lasting kind of Twachman mark on Greenwich beyond just Twachman's home itself. Yeah, do you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember, um, do we know where he's buried? Is it in yes, Gloucester? In Gloucester, in Gloucester, yeah. in the same cemetery is Fitzhenry Lane. Oh yeah, yeah. So. Um, do you know, I wonder if, um, you know, we had another question just talking about Twachtman um, and his relationship to other painters, other artists who we now associate with Koskob, with this, this art colony in Koskob. Um, who were, I mean, who were really Twachtman's closest friends? Um, who among those artists um, were, were was he closest to and, and, you know, what was the nature of their relationship? Well, he was close to the artists who were in, in the 10. I mean, I, he, 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 Weir was his closest from the first minute they met, they had a, you know, mm -hmm. a, a connection that, that they did never lost throughout their lives. And um, Twachman's letters to Weir are a real, a real treasure. Unfortunately, we don't have the letters Twachman received because he didn't, he didn't keep things. Yeah. He didn't title paintings, he didn't keep records. So that's quite unfortunate, but he was, you know, he was close to Thomas Dewing. He was close to Hassam. Um, he was very close to Theodore Robinson, who actually predeceased him. And Robinson would come and stay with him in between the, his his long periods of time that he spent in Giverny. So Robinson, in, in some ways, was a kind of liaison between Greenwich and Giverny. Um, he he had a he had a lot of very a lot of very close friendships amongst the artists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I, I, it's, I think I've, uh, you was, have mentioned to me before, um, you know, some of, uh, I think the, the fam, the specific, specifically his family's relationship, but I think it was Robinson mm -hmm. um, in the time that he would spend with them staying, staying as a house guest. Right. And we have the wonderful Robinson painting of Twachman's house in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. Um, I have another question here I'm going to bring up from the group, and that is, you know, I think you you mentioned a little bit, um, you know, Twachman eventually getting employment um, with the Art Students League, teaching, um, drawing from the antique uh, casts. Um, but, you know, given that he was studying in Europe, that he was traveling extensively, um, I mean, you know, what what was what was Twachman's sort of financial situation like? I think you kind of gave us a little bit of sense of that, but I wonder if you could could kind of elaborate a little bit more. Well, he he eked by with his with his teaching salary, and he did some illustration work. Um, maybe sold a couple things here and there, um, and he also did have some help from his father-in-law, who was a a doctor um, in Cincinnati. Um, but other than that, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't think he had any other sources of income. So I have, I have a question I wanted to put to you about um, sort of the the project of the catalog resume. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one thing um, I think we've spoken about this, um, but this the the Twachman catalog resume is basically one of of several of these new. Um, digital catalog resume or artist database initiatives that's that's mm -hmm. starting to appear more and more. And I think it's exciting for this project because it really feels as though it is on the vanguard of a new kind of art historical scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, you know, just having worked for so long on the preparation of this catalog resume, which from, from what I understand may have had a life 
previously where it was maybe intended as a book. I wonder if you can just having seen this field change over time, talk about why this is happening and, and why we're seeing this proliferation of digital catalog resume. Right, well, I think what's, what's driving it is that there's a, just a recognition that there are major advantages to a digital format for a catalog resume in, in terms of the multitude of ways you can search and the remarkable flexibility that you can have to expand in many dimensions so that you can start in one place and end up somewhere else and dig in very deeply. And you can also reach wider audiences than, than in a book that you might have to go consult, go to a library to consult. Um, and that access is also helpful in preventing the, the spread of, of misinformation. Um, and I, I do consider the Twarkman catalog to be to be a book in some respects, but also uh, as part of a virtual constellation of interactions with other other digital uh, um, projects. Mm -hmm. So they're just the way that it can link up its content um, with with so many different other um, sites and ways ways of doing. Uh -huh. Well, and it seems you're right, and it seems as though you know, as you said, there's there's the opportunity for continuous updates or or expansion. So, yeah, um, and one you know one thing that I've noticed is that um, just the the ability to say browse you know in the way that you only can on a screen um, a selection of of so many artworks in one place, sort of all gathered together, it does give you a sense of just the scope of someone's life's work. Um, so I think I actually, um, we're getting to be just past seven o'clock. So I think I'm gonna ask just one more question for you um, coming in from our chat, but just thinking about Twalk, sort of the arc of Twachman's career. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he obviously came here to Greenwich. He made it his home for about a decade within the sort of total body of his work. I mean, how, how much of, of his, um, his total output, would you say, is is made up by his Greenwich paintings, or is it, or or do they sort of just take up a, an outsized um, uh, presence in in discussing his work? I don't have the number specifically, but I would say it's about maybe about a third of his work. Um, really? He certainly produced a lot of work from a very you know limited subject matter that he 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 felt was limitless. So. Um, well, Lisa, you know, I think what I'm going to do is um, go ahead and kind of um, leave it there because we're we're hitting just after seven. Um, but before closing, I do really want to thank you um, on giving this excellent talk tonight. Um, and honestly, for your years of scholarship that went into building this resource. I mean, I think I have to say on behalf of the Greenwich Historical Society, um, we're so pleased to be able to be partnering with you and working together and bringing this project to a public audience. So thank you so much. Thank you as well. It's, it's a pleasure. Great. Well, I'm just going to um, say a few things before we conclude here. Um, and one is, I'm just gonna bring up a slide here. I do encourage those of you who have not had a chance to do so yet, um, please do go explore the Twachman Catalog Resonate yourself. Um, as Lisa indicated, you can access it um, at jhtwachman.org, but you can also reach it. I'll mention, oops, I'll just make sure I can do my slides here. Um, you can also reach it through the Greenwich Historical Society's website. It's listed as a digital resource under our library and archives section. Um, registration and use is really easy. You just have to create a free user account, give your email address, and then you're just ready to go. And so you can spend hours and hours exploring if, you, if you'd like to. Um, and just one thing I wanted to mention as well, um, Lisa is, as we know, also the curator of our upcoming exhibition, Life and Art, um, here at the Greenwich Ex Historical Society. Um, the exhibition publication, the exhibit catalog, I just wanted to make a plug. That book has been published and it's available for purchase. Um, you can uh, get copies if you go to the Greenwich Historical Society's website and visit our museum store. Um, so you'll just have to go to the website. There's a little store button in the upper right-hand corner. 
Um, and the, the, it's a beautiful publication. It features a great essay by Lisa. Um, it's, of course, beautifully illustrated. Uh, and we're really proud of that project. And we're grateful to have had the support of the YF Foundation for American Art to bring that about. Um, so just to conclude a few thank yous, the one thing I wanted to say is just, um, you know, we mentioned it at the top of the program, um, but just one more thank you, I think, to John Nelson, who's a friend of ours and the steward and current, current occupant of the Twachman House. Um, which is really a special place. Um, I said before that that um, he's a great advocate for Twachman, and I think that um, you know he's done a lot, and we're really looking forward to working together to um, explore opportunities to share um, this space with visitors who enjoy Twachman, enjoy American art. Um, so just a thank you to him. For those who um, may not be familiar with this house, or if, if you're from Greenwich, you may have a sense of this already. Um, but this is a house that really has an extraordinary legacy, even beyond the story of John Henry Twachman. From 1839 to 1878, it was the home, uh, or it was owned by a man named Alan Green. Um, Alan Green was an African American man. He was a prominent resident in this particular part of town, which at that time was known as Hang Root, um, which was a notable 19th century Black community in Greenwich. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of history there. Um, after Twachman's time, not only um, was it the home of, of Twachman, but then in um, the 1960s, for some time, several years, it was the home of Jim Henson, uh, the, the creator of the Muppets of Sesame Street. Uh, so Jim Henson and his family lived there as well. Um, obviously, genuinely another one of America's great artistic voices. Um, so it's a, a special place that's seen a lot of history. Um, so thank you once again, Lisa. I would just, just say thanks to Deborah Mecki for our um, introduction this evening. Um, one more thanks to the folks here who are behind the scenes that made this evening pro uh, possible, um, especially Stephanie Barnett, Kai Pandolfino. Um, and finally, thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, have a really good night and keep well, everyone. Thanks.